Hey, what's happening, all you dudes and dudettes? This is Dudes Talking Freedom back at you once again. This is Luke, and I'm here with Jeremy and Garrett Linker. Are y'all DTF? I'm always DTF. You know I'm DTF. And I'm definitely DTF. We're brought to you by Warriors for Freedom, a nonprofit that creates pathways to engage service members, veterans, and their families to prevent suicide, create camaraderie, and help them live their best lives. Check them out at warriorsforfreedom.org. And be sure and subscribe to Dudes Talking Freedom Podcast and share with all your friends. All right, folks, we're talking school board, freedom, and whatever the hell else we want to talk about. So let's get into it, shall we? Let's do it. Awesome. Garrett, it's great to have you back again. Yeah. Thanks for um, having me. Yeah, man. We're uh, we're trying this new format to our, uh, our viewers and our listeners. Um, if you've heard a couple of our previous episodes with Garrett, uh, local school board member here in Prosper, Texas, uh, where we all live. And uh, the, third, the third Monday of every month, there is a school board meeting. Uh, to talk about all things going on with the school district down here in Prosper, Texas. And we've invited Garrett to join us monthly on our Tuesday following that school board meeting each month so that we could talk about what's going on um, with the school board locally uh, and also what are some other national school board uh, topics in, in other states or other uh, parts of the country that we could we could um, kind of discuss and, and what may or may not impact us here. But certainly having impact on other parts of the country as well and get your opinions on things like that. And so really appreciate you joining us every yeah. month going forward. It's going to be Happy great. Happy to be here. We're, I think it's great to raise about it. awareness in our community on what these local elections uh, or how these local elections matter and how they impact all of us here and what we do. Yeah, it's great. You've, you've made uh, a bit of an impact already and it sounds like there's a lot going on right now. Um, we've got it's been a busy five months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we did quiet uh, little town in North Texas. I know it has it's been we've been in the news a little bit, but let's let's we'll table the we'll table the recap on on kind of the big news items for a, a, a couple minutes. And sure. And by the way, we're missing a couple of guys, right? Yeah, yeah the we, I know we sh- so they're on vacation. Um, I wish we were on vacation, but they were um, Vinny's in Jamaica with his family. Block, block. And uh, <laughs> Jeff's <laughs> celebrating his anniversary with his lovely bride Ashley in Antigua. Yeah. So that's where we went on our honeymoon, my wife and I, oh, thirteen nice. years ago. Actually, almost to the week. Oh, wow, good for you. We just had our seventeenth in September. Congrats. Yeah, long time, man. <laughs> long time, seventeen. Just flies by, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. It's gone before you know it. Yes. Do not say oh, anything. Man. You'll regret. Your wives are listening, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, love you. I love you so much. Love you. <laughs> mean it. Um, but yeah, they're they're both on. It's crazy. We, we when we do like a business plan, business planning meeting every you know couple of months, just kind of forecast what's coming down the pike and who we have coming on for guests, and you know what can we get lined up, and um, you know we're doing a live stream for the elections right. coming up. On oh, the that's 8th. awesome. Yeah, and then we've got cool. an interview coming up. With a local uh, uh, legend named Sarge, he's uh, uh, ex-military and is you know he's a big fan of the show. He's going to come on. We're going to talk to him and, and release uh, right around um, Veterans, Veterans Day, Day yeah. coming up in oh, that's November, awesome. which so, is our one-year anniversary of launch. Really, yeah, roughly, um, yeah. we did record quite a few episodes before then, but our official launch date with all the rest of those episodes was right around Veterans Day. Really. Yeah, it's been about a year. We dropped, I think, five on the same day. We had done a bunch of, like, just, you know, casual recordings, just kind of getting our feet wet, and we just decided, like, all right, these are all pretty decent. Let's just release them all. Whose the idea was it, the, the first person to say, hey, let's do a podcast? Uh, we kind of were all talking about it. Um, you know, during COVID, we were all doing a lot of driveway drinking, right. hanging out, and, you know, getting to know each Heavily. other quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was we all checked in. Yeah, and and uh, mostly, it, it kind of started off. It, I mean, it was mostly like at first, Luke and I had mentioned the podcast idea to each other, and then Vince and I were talking about it once, and and I said, you know, I mentioned to Vince, I was like, you know, it'd be really cool if we just recorded these types of conversations and just release them. Cause you know, we have fun doing it and you know, 
a lot of the other guys that would hang out with us, you know, we'd laugh and we'd joke around and, you know, talk about different things. And, um, you know, COVID progressed and, um, gave you more material, gave you, gave us more <laughs> so material. Much. And and then of course, you know, the election and, you know, all those things kind of snowballed and then Afghanistan. And that's really what broke the camel's back for me. And I had said to these guys, like, we got to, like we got to start talking about the issues more, um, yeah. both locally and nationally, because, um, not to man. mention it's kind of the podcast gold rush right now. Like it's yeah. everywhere. Everybody's starting a podcast. I mean, who doesn't know a couple of people that have started a podcast? I know probably, mm-hmm. I don't know, half a dozen people. Yeah. I like that you guys have a mix now of the national issues, world issues, but then also, building your local community and and awareness. I think that's awesome. Yeah. That was the thing. Um, more recently we were talking about like the direction we want to take it. And we're like, we, we talk about a lot of national issues. We get a decent number of guests on, you know, our goal is to have like one or two guests a month. And, you know, we've had you on a couple of times, obviously. And, you know, we, we, we want to, we want to get more well known in the local community because we think that the local, you know, the local involvement will have a more of an impact, um, both here in, in prosper Texas, but throughout Texas. And then of course will permeate out nationally as well. Cause I think people can take, you know, we've had Amy Borden from up in Connecticut where she's gotten really involved in a lot of school board meetings up there. She's not on the school board, but she's a concerned parent, um, who I'm, I'm friends with. And, she's been on a couple of times and shared what's going on up in Connecticut. And so it's really good to have both that national perspective, the local perspective. And, and of course, you know, we have a lot of friends locally here and, you know, we we're all making our homes here and our families are, are kind of it's being scalable here. It's so. with, it's with the grain, right? Like it's just kind of the conversations we've had, right? It's just kind of sends you that direction and you just kind of let, let the world take you to where you, where you need to be. Mm-hmm. And here we are. Yeah. So, um, so we had, uh, you had a school board meeting yesterday. We had a meeting last night. Yep. And what were the big, uh, items? The big item was zoning. Mm-hmm. So we're opening high school number three, Walnut Grove. We moved that up a full school year. Um, the construction manager, uh, was able to just because of weather and I guess materials are more available now. He was able to get that, uh, moved up a full school year. So that was the first decision we made. Then once we made the decision, it was, okay, now we got to figure out zoning. And that's always a tough one because it impacts so many kids, their families, the community, sports, extracurriculars, you know, band, all all the arts. And so you have to try to figure out what makes the most sense so you're not interrupting kids again in the future by yo-yo zoning them. What's going to relieve the population and then what just makes sense on those lines. So that was something we've been working on the last couple of weeks. And then last night we adopted those zones. Yo-yo zoning. I've never heard that term. It's like yo-yo <laughs> dieting. It's like gerrymandering. But yeah. Yo-yos. Well, it's, I mean, we don't, a lot of people don't have those problems, right? We have those problems because we're, we're in hyper growth mode down yeah. here, right? A lot of people moving to Texas. Um, I would imagine some other parts of the country have similar issues where people are moving in droves to like, Florida communities or Arizona communities. So our super, our superintendent last night, sh- I don't know the exact stat, but something about Prosper ISD just in the last year, we added over 3,000 kids. That's crazy. And if you, I guess if you look back in s- the state history, that's only happened in a school district maybe two or three times ever. Um, and so we're definitely one of the fastest growing in Texas and then if you look nationally, I'm sure we're probably up there too. Yeah, I bet. It's crazy how fast, how many people are moving. I always see us mentioned nationally. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, yeah, we are growing. But if you ask the census, right, like they, they undercounted all the conservative states. Did you guys see that? I did see that, actually. It was a, this last, this summer, they released a, a thing where they over they undercounted all pretty much all these conservative states and they overcounted all the liberal states. They actually undercounted Arkansas, Florida, Illinois, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas, and they overcounted Delaware, Hawaii, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New York, Ohio, Rhode Island, and Utah. So they're gonna get all these electoral college uh, votes, and then you know these red states they're not gonna get them. 
And there's pretty much nothing that they can do about it short of like getting a Supreme Court ruling on it, which isn't Until very years likely right to happen, right? This is done through like the mailers, right? And, oh, since his workers are coming door to door. Yeah. Oh, the door to door. Okay. So, but I think you can mail workers. it in too. Yeah. I always felt like I got like something in the mail and I had to fill it out and send it back. Um, then if it doesn't come back, that's where I think they're walking neighborhoods. Right. So, yeah, they need to get a material amount, which statistically is 3%, right? Like, so they got to go out into an area and um, get a certain amount of people. And I think they said like 114,000 out of each district was how many they needed uh, in order to get it. It says it in that, in that article mm-hmm. that I was reading. I don't know. So there's a number. We so three thousand new kids. Three thousand new kids in the last twelve months. And just to ish. give you perspective, uh, Prosper High <laughs> is going to be at like thirty three hundred kids when we start next year. So we literally is that the added real the size number? of a high school. Is we don't know. The, okay, that can't so, be the real number. I feel like it's got to be. I mean, I've seen pictures. And so the projection, yeah, that's our, that's our projection based upon the zones. But we did elect to give incoming seniors a choice. Once we know how many seniors are going to be choosing to stay at either PHS or Rock Hill versus going to Walnut, um, then we'll have those more accurate figures. And we also don't know how many new kids are going to move in between now and next fall. Mm. So we, we're literally Lots, adding I'm the guessing. size of a high school in one year. That's tough, especially right now with the slowdown, and, you know, what's really happening. Yeah, I wonder how many, I mean, you know, the housing market has slowed down a little bit in terms of, you know, the new, like new housing is, is, I mean, down here is a little different than other parts of the country, but I still feel like houses are staying on the market longer for sure. You know, I mean, one of our neighbors has, has been trying to sell for a couple months now. Yeah, a lot um, of them, yeah. And, you know, I see some signs on homes and they kind of stick around for a while, you know, right. and um, rates are high. Yeah. There's 30 years in the sevens. Yeah, That's so insane. I mean, yeah. people people are probably a little less likely to unless they're coming with cash, which is, you know, maybe um, you know homes aren't cheap, <laughs> right. and so coming with cash is 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 tough. Can be tough. I I just wonder how many how many more people are going to move here in the next year or so if it's going to be a a bit of a slowdown, you know? There's also uh, our deputy superintendent last night made a point that typically our elementary schools are growing the quickest and and they still are growing really fast. But with our house prices having gone up so much, typically your elementary school age families are maybe their first home or, you know, they've got younger kids. So they're early in their career. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but now that our home price has gone up so much, we're seeing a lot more secondary and high school age kids. They're more established families. It's maybe not their first home. Yeah. And so that is also skewing our high school numbers yeah, up higher. Sense. And I hadn't thought about that. Huh. I didn't either. Yeah, me neither until you just said it. <laughs> yeah, you have. I guess you have that piece of the wave, right? And then you have the piece of the wave that's just, it's always pretty much fixed, which is people that are getting transferred that have to come right. here and they have to find a home because they have to start work on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> and those like, people are, they're just going to have to pay. Right. Yeah. So when you guys go through this process, I know that they, they kind of put it out to a lot of parents or, right. or kids and parents, families to say, you know, how do you want, you know, what's your feedback? How do you like, how does that process and how do those decisions get made? Like, that's that's like asking for trouble, in my opinion, when you're like, yeah. hey, let's figure out what everybody wants and, and then let's try to make a decision based on what thousands of people f- give us feedback on. Right. So when when the board and administration's working and, and figuring, OK, well, this is something that's going to happen. So we're going to be opening up the school. We have a zoning committee, which we have committees for different things. And within our school board, we've got our finance committee. We've got zoning. We've got a naming committee, a municipality connection committee, communication. So a bunch of different. What does the naming committee do? They come up with uh, names for schools. Oh, so okay. as right. we're opening up new schools, they, they know a lot more about the history. So they're some of our more longer ter- longer serving trustees. And uh, so they'll bring names recommended um, from either their contributions to our district or, or whatever it is. And then they make a recommendation and then the board will vote. Our zoning committee, and they're all made up of three members, by the way, because if you have a, f- a fourth person, then you're at a quorum, and right. you've got to have it meetings and minutes and all of that. So if it's three, then you don't have to have minutes because it's not a quorum. Odd mm-hmm. man out. Yeah. 
So our zoning committee works with our deputy superintendent and the rest of admin, plus the demographers to figure out where are the, where's the growth patterns and then trying to figure out based on that, how to draw the lines so they don't have to be changed again the yeah. next year. That's what the yo-yo zoning is. So you, you set the zones and then the next year things have changed. Now you've got to move that kid again yeah. and, and you don't want to, you don't want to put the students through that. Right. So, so they kind of figure out tentatively what the lines are going to look like. That then got released to the public earlier this month. Uh, and then that went into a period where they were collecting feedback from the community. And so all that feedback was logged. And then they had two forums hosted last week, one at PHS, one at Rock Hill to essentially bring people in, go through the presentation, ask, you know, what their thoughts are, let them interact with the board. And then we go out into our meeting last night and continue that conversation. And based upon all the feedback that we've gotten and the data that we're looking at, try to make the best decision Mm. and it's hard. So just to make it not so hard, you started off with an Eagle and then we got a blue Hawk and now Walnut Grove's a wildcat. wildcat. So I thought we were all going to be birds and different colored birds. We need a DTF high school. It just just (laughs) blew my mind. What's high school four going to be? I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, like what? A longhorns? A longhorn? I sure hope not. I don't know that. <laughs> uh, Maybe. That's going to upset a lot of people that uh, aren't Texas longhorn fans, mm. like UT fans. Uh, then, you, then what are the yeah. Texas, what are the Red Raiders going to do? And what are the Aggies? Mm-hmm. And this and the, yeah, you know. they're all going to get bent out of shape because their mascot <laughs> isn't being selected in their, you know, town. Hometown. Maybe we should be the like the star and just go ahead and adopt like the Dallas Cowboys insignia instead of the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, maybe we can just do a little bit of one upsmanship out on the west side or I don't know, like maybe for high school four. Cowboys would be cool. <laughs> Whatever, you know. I mean, it is Texas. I was trying to find something I was gonna show you. Yeah. Yeah. So we had it was all the birds and then when we had our uh let's see. Our third middle school opened, and we were the Raptors. Yeah, the Raptors. And so I was asking, I said, goes, um, I, I asked uh, the board and admin, because I'm, I'm new to this, how, how the name, like if they let the students come up with the mascot. Yeah. And I guess in middle school, they do. Oh, really? And so cool. I don't know if it was a joke or serious, but someone had said that it was almost the Avengers. <laughs> oh, geez. Rushing oh, Avengers. Oh, that would have been bad. So That's too I don't much know if you would have had me. to license that with Disney or how that would have worked, but I'm pretty sure. yeah. So we ended up with Raptors. If you used a, a uh, their likeness, you would probably have to. Name but an event, no one has a no one has a a monopoly on the word Avengers, you know. I guess that's true. I, you know, like Raptors. Like, what about the Toronto Raptors? You know, they yeah. can't like claim that it's theirs. You yeah, know what I mean, so I mean, Avengers seems a little bit more unique than Raptors. You know, at least it's it not does. on the Raptors binomial cool, nomenclature. You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Raptors it'll be, be cool. It'll be interesting with when number four opens. What what theme? What theme we go with? Colors, yes. all that. So how'd they decide? Uh, you said in. You know, you just got through saying that they have a team of experts come in, the team of three, right? Like the determine. naming committee. Yeah. yeah I so. was not part of the walnut naming, so I don't know. Yeah. But I assume they brought the color recommendations, the mascot, and then the name. So surely it's going to be a new color, high school four. Do they have an estimate on how many total high schools they think they'll six. eventually have? Six. At build out. At build out, we're slated for six. Okay. Wow, and by what's the estimated time frame for so for that? number four is supposed to open fall of twenty five, okay. So and then usually every two years, so twenty five, twenty seven, maybe by twenty nine, will be a build out. I don't know. Hmm. Okay, hmm. and prob- they try to bounce back and forth. So Walnut's going in more on the east side of the district. Number four will go in over here on the west side. Five will go back over on the east and then six kind of in our area again okay yeah and it's probably led a little bit by demographics and uh well it, it will mean, be every two years will be unless fully built out for several years so the, that makes sense yeah yeah if the velocity of population changes you know i'm sure that the uh the layout schedule could change too right like, right mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, you know, you know, never know what's going to happen. I mean, the economy and the, you know, materials are being are, are a little bit more readily available, as you were saying. But you know, 
How yeah. much do you, I wrote down the numbers so I didn't forget. How much do you think the new high school costs? What did you guess? Mm. And, uh, then, and then I'll tell you middle school number five. For, for, the, for the build out of the school, like all in? Yeah, approximate. With the land too? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think. I'm gonna go yeah. with I'm gonna go with uh twenty seven and a half million. I'm for gonna, the high school? Yeah. Go home. Yeah. I was gonna go with twenty seven point six million. Uh, just to be such an a ass. fucking one offer, dude. But yeah. I was thinking more like thirty five, forty. I don't know. Is it higher than that? It's like <laughs> sixty. It really? Sixty. A hundred and twenty no. million, seriously? Two hundred million? Seriously? Two hundred million dollars? To build a fucking high school? Holy well, wait, crap. is this no wonder a, our taxes are so high? Yeah, is this with a natatorium up? and another football yeah, that, field? I mean, well, not football stadium, but it's, it's with sp- it's with their arenas and everything. Oh, okay. And then the middle schools. What would you say for middle school? We just last night we did our guaranteed maximum price for our um, next middle school. Well, I mean, if it's two hundred, keep in mind million. this is all like twenty five percent more than what it typically is, just because of materials. It's crazy. Well, lumber Inflation. prices have actually come down. Way down, but anyway, I'm sure we're not getting those prices. That's insane. Uh, I mean, I, how many I'm total acres is it on? Middle school's right? got to be eighty. Really, hundred and twenty? No, not quite. Hundred. About hundred. About half. Dang. And then our elementaries, those have gone up a lot. Those were in the twenties. Now they're at thirty-five. Man, I just could. Two hundred, one hundred, forty. That expensive. Wow. It is. Yeah, it's crazy. And. We've kind of done, at least with the the two most recent high schools and then with all of our elementary schools, they, they all have real similar footprints. So, I mean, we're they're trying to be as efficient as they can with, you know, they're not redesigning it every time. Yeah. But, yeah, it's crazy. What, so we save 100000 on the architectural fee? <laughs> Don't you know, like, <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I mean, what's a hundred thousand dollars? One percent, hundred million. No, half it's not a even percent. Close. Is it even not even half a percent? No, it's like what is it like a point oh oh one percent? I mean, ten million dollars. You're looking at, uh, yeah. Well, no, one hundred thousand is ten percent of a million. Yeah, you know, and a hundred million, then that's point one percent. Two hundred million is point oh oh five percent. Right. I wasn't following all that, but sure. Yeah, it's nothing. It's a hat. It's, it's absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's a f- f- small It's fraction. a rounding error. It is. The one thing though, one thing that they're trying to do with our middle schools is they're doing two they're doing another level um with this next one that's opening. And like when you say another level like a third uh, floor? Y- yeah, so basically they're they're increasing the square footage by I don't know what the exact square footage amount is off the top of my head, but the hope is that doing that over the next couple middle schools will actually reduce having to build out that final one. So that, you know, hundred million dollars right there or whatever the oh. price would be years from now. Just raise to the try roof. to save. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> raise the roof, save some money. No, nice. it's expensive to build. It's crazy. Big. I mean, that's I, two. I'm on, my mind is blown on that high yeah. school number. 200 million is a ton of yeah. money. Next fall, we've got two elementary schools opening, which is number 16 and 17. We've got our early education opening and high school three. And and yeah. and where where does all the money come from? Bonds. Bonds. Okay. <laughs> Wu Tang Financial. Yeah, they don't they don't <laughs> they don't build schools out of the operating budget. That's that's all for payroll and pay our teachers. Yeah. We want to pay them more. Oh man, that's that's wild. I mean, how many square feet are these uh schools? Don't ask me that. You don't know? Thousands. Yeah. Thousands of square feet. I mean, tens of, yeah. ten, tens of thousands, I'm guessing. They're probably, huge, right? Yeah. I mean, crazy. you go into these high schools down here in Texas, especially these new ones. I mean, they're, they're but a But look how huge, how huge PHS is, and they're yeah. still overcrowded. I know. So Prosper High School was $113.5 million when they did it, right? Like, it was 590,000 square feet. That's 590,000 square feet. That, that must include gym, the gym and sure. uh, additional facilities. I mean, Probably, even the freaking stadium, middle schools here, they have these like collegiate like weight rooms. They're crazy. If That's, you have a chance, and, and they're doing this right now through um, Prosper Promise, where you can sign up to go take a tour, go take a tour of PHS and Rock Hill if you haven't. I yeah. mean, it's, they're amazing. Uh, you, they're 
they're nicer than probably a lot of colleges. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we uh, I went uh, at um, Rock Hill. They have Hilltop Cafe. So mm-hmm. they and and part of an elective that the students can take is to actually go and do culinary, and they've got like a restaurant style kitchen, probably better than most restaurants. Um, and these kids are able to learn from trained chefs or pastry chefs. That's awesome. And I went a couple weeks ago and was able to talk to the student that, you know, was serving us and, and she was the one that was helping to cook and she wants to go be a pastry chef in New York when really? she graduates. And it's, I mean, it's pretty cool. So there's things like that that we're able to do. We didn't have that in any of my high schools. Um, I'd like to talk to her about her decision to go to New York, but <laughs> you know, we had, sure. we had a home ec, you know, where we made some French fries in class and that was about it. Uh, they've got, I mean, their, their journalism room, <laughs> sort of it pillow. looks like a news station when you go in there. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. We didn't do any of that in home ec. We'd maybe learn how to make a muffin and sew a pillow. That was about it. Sew a pillow. Yeah. That was I mean, it, man. Yeah. With our initials on it, like a button. Um, so that's a things just, have changed. Just in '09, when they built Prosper High School, by the way, that's $192 a square foot. Just in case you're wondering, I'm stuck up on these numbers. Sorry, guys. Well, you're a numbers guy, um, and you you're the only one who can generally do math on the fly. Is me, Vinny, and Jeff. I just don't even try. It's pretty hard. I shouldn't. I should. you're, I, you're a numbers guy too, though, by trade. Yeah, but so. that's why I don't. Because of that, I, I try not. I just. Don't do it on the fly. I need an Excel spreadsheet in front of me, really. <laughs> I usually do, too. Preferably. Like calculator, Excel spreadsheet, you know, usually pretty helpful. But so <clears throat> um, so zoning is uh, a big issue, right? Yeah, it's a huge issue. Because of it's, the influx of people yep. and the influx of kids. And, you know, we're, we're growing out of our britches like every month, it seems yep. like. And I want to say one thing before you move on with, uh, from zoning. It's a super emotional issue, like I said a little while ago, um, deciding where kids are going to have to be pulled from. And sure. so if there's any kids that are listening to this, uh, the board as a whole really, if we could have, we would have wanted to give every student the choice. Mm-hmm. We gave incoming seniors a choice because it's their last year. I would have loved to give incoming juniors a choice. I struggled with it. A lot of the board members did. But <laughs> if that was done, then the decision to move the opening up early um, there would have been no crowding relief at PHS. So it was one of those things that was really hard. And, and then as I was kind of thinking through it, someone had made a point that, you know, with Walnut opening, there potentially is now a lot more opportunity. Maybe kids that weren't able to make certain teams or do cheer or band. Um, now you've got a whole new school open and maybe potential for kids that weren't able to do that. So that, that was something I thought about. And But it's hard. I It was not an easy decision. And I hope parents know that we really tried to do what's right for them. Yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> uh, you guys have uh, a really tough job um, trying to figure those things out, especially in a town like Prosper that's growing at the rate that it's growing. It's it. There's no easy or perfect answer, right? You know, to solve those problems, and so you do the best you can. So, well, if everybody really stays, it, thank you. At one school, and they open up another school, then you've just you know outfitted an entire school with full administration and teachers and everything. And they're just going to be standing around doing not much in an empty school. Right. Yeah. Cause everybody's going to want to stay. So send yeah. them on over. Yeah. And honestly, the Sorry. biggest complaints we were getting at the beginning of the year, the first couple of weeks was, I don't know if you saw those pictures in the hallway at PHS between passing periods. Yeah. So crowded. Yeah. And that's so that's why the shoulder. admin and, and the board said, is there anything we can do to, to provide some relief? So, and what if something, Terrible happened there, you know, and everybody had to run for the exit or whatever yeah. it is. You know, I mean, they're well, the trampling situation. Yeah. It looked like a South American soccer state. Well, that's that was my right? big concern when I saw those images. Um, was no offense know, what, to South what, America, what, right? <laughs> but what happens if, you know, God forbid, there's uh, an active shooter situation at the school, and you've got you know thousands of kids shoulder to shoulder in between class? I mean, you literally will have that trampling situation and a bunch of kids could could be could get hurt you know yeah. um so it is it's scary and you know or if there's a fire or some something goes wrong you know yep um, not to mention like uh their ability to learn uh increases as class sizes go down right yep. like well, the teacher to ch- student ratio yep. is a really important part and of we have like 35 important. lunch periods with how many 
kids are at PHS. I'm exaggerating, but there's a ton of lunch periods. Well, yeah, well, even sure. my daughter has lunch at 1.30 p.m. in fifth grade uh, elementary, you know? I mean, they start at like, it's like 10.30. Yeah, like 10. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, some but kids are eating lunch at 10 o'clock. Our high schools were built for 2,800 students, and right now PHS is close to 4,000. It's got to be more than that. It's got to wow. be. It's we're be. under, as no. of our most recent... Um, you call in Garrett census. a liar? No, no, I just don't know that. They're, they're, <laughs> 3772. Well, we were Jesus. just saying how the censuses are all fucked up. So <laughs> I don't know if they could. No, uh, I mean, I, 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 I believe the numbers. I just, I just, it just seems like there's way more than that, yeah. you know? Um, but anyway, um, so a couple of weeks back, uh, after you actually, after you were on last time, um, we had a little scandal erupt here in town. Um, I'll call it a scandal. I don't know, for lack of a better term, I guess. But Seems pretty scandalous to me. I'll, yeah, I'll back you up on yeah, that. Yeah, it does but. seem a little bit scandalous. But you were on. You know, we recorded with you on a Tuesday, and yeah. then we released the episode on a Thursday. I forget the date, but quite literally that evening, an article broke about the uh, pedophile bus driver here in town. And right. we, t- we talked about it on the cast uh, a couple of times since then. Uh, and just to recap for our listeners, both locally and nationally, you know, I think local people know what happened, uh, or at least know what went on in the media, uh, and what was being said. And then there, you know, I think some national attention was brought to it as well. I mean, it was a pretty big, it was a pretty big deal, but just as a quick recap, uh, a, a, a pedophile, bus driver, alleged pedophile bus driver, uh, ultimately killed himself in prison after he was arrested. And from what the media was saying and from what the parents were saying about what happened was that uh, their their seven and five-year-old girls were being sexually abused by a bus driver throughout the school year last year before you were on the board um, it sounds like this this was taking place and then they brought it to the school district to the school uh, an investigation was launched immediately it sounds like uh, police were brought in police looked at some camera footage on the buses and had you know done a, a little investigation and then uh, subsequently arrested the bus driver he threw himself off a second floor balcony in county died from his injuries a few days later and 10 days later um and then Frank Paniagua. Yeah. And then, he, uh, so since then there was an, uh, there was a bit of an uproar in town. Um, in, there was some speculation that, uh, the superintendent had maybe tried to kind of squash it with the parents or at least try to get them to avoid any sort of media attention. And I know now there's an investigation that's happening and to figure out what exactly was said, what went wrong. And, I saw some other things too about whether or not the investigation was going to be unbiased based on who was going to do the investigation and what type of connections that the investigators had to the school board or to the school district or something along those lines. I don't have all the specific details, but what can you tell us about where that whole thing stands today? Yeah. So pretty much everything that you said was, um, I think the timeline was pretty accurate. The May 7th, which was a Saturday, it was actually election day. <clears throat> that was the day that the allegations were presented. And yes, all those things happened quickly. He was arrested. He was removed. He wasn't back on a bus after those allegations er, were made. And then uh, after doing their investigation with town police and then bringing in you know, uh, other law enforcement, they reviewed the videos thought there was enough to it that he was arrested and then he killed himself. So obviously the news breaking was a huge concern to not just me, other board members, admin, teachers, families, everybody in this community. And it was devastating to read and to think about that. I have daughters that are similar age to, um, to these victims and kind of just trying to figure out what happened, how it happened, how, how things were handled and, and how we go from here. And so for me, hearing so much feedback from the community questions, um, you know, concerns about how things were handled 
for me, I, I didn't see any way forward other than just having, having an independent investigation, just so we can have that confidence and tell the community that things were handled correctly. Or if it's not, then of course we have to figure something out, but transparency, yeah, it wasn't at all. My calling for that was not at all to question how things were handled. I, I'm not making any assumption or decision. I, I just truly want to know and, and for the community to have that same level of confidence because if we don't have that, we have nothing. Parents are sending their kids to our in, in our hands every day, right? So right. they have to trust and know that they're safe. And so I... Yeah, that's what's going to fill up that fourth, fifth, and sixth high school, right? Like, exactly. And so for me, that was that was the reason why I was so passionate about that. And um, there was a Facebook post that I had made and, um, you know, it, I, I didn't, some people I think have misunderstood why I did that. Uh, I've, I've had some people say it's, you know, I was trying to grandstand or, you know, do something to show myself as more pro kid than, than somebody else. And it wasn't that at all. I just felt that I made promises to be transparent, uh, to tell the truth. And I feel like at every step, that's my responsibility. And so, um, so I just decided to, to do that, to be honest and open and, and essentially let the community know that I believed that an independent investigation was important, that I didn't feel that having a, a litigator that was looking into the lawsuit be the same person to investigate. I just didn't think that was the right decision. It's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a conflict of interest, but there is a connection, right? right. And when there is a connection there could enter some bias into the equation, right? Well, and, and if the investigation turns out that everything was handled the right way, you don't want the community questioning it. And, and if it was right. the same person handling it, there would be those questions. And so I, I felt like for admin's sake, for the board's sake, for the community's sake, for the parents' sake, for everybody, it I had to that. be. If it's it in the middle of nowhere, okay, fine. Maybe there's not that many like reputable places that can achieve something like this, but we're, we're in DFW. There's plenty of firms that can be a true independent third party investigation. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that it's just terrible foresight to think that that was okay personally. Yeah, it, uh, it was that that's how I felt. And, and so there was, we had our normal uh, board meeting in August, which was, was it August? And the dates are all, but there was one that was extremely emotional. Tons of people speaking. That was um, uh, August. Like was that August. was two. Yeah, that was two. Right. That was then, two months ago. And then we had the special meeting right after that, um, and that's where we ended up um, making a motion to hire an independent firm, and and that passed. So good. Right. Yeah, we'll be. I'm sure we'll be getting a briefing um, soon on kind of what's happened. It was going to take a couple of weeks to to get that started, and some information may not be available to be released publicly. But at some point there will be, and and then I hope that everything is shown, you know, to have been done the right way. And the community, while they obviously it's a devastating event, they at least trust the people that are educating their kids and, yeah. and have them for most of the day. Yeah, um, I mean, look, I don't think it has anything to do with the the, the people educating the kids i i think that there were some things that were missed you know clearly there were some things that were missed right there's either some procedures or policies or just general common sense was lacking in certain scenarios um you know when the girl's showing up late to school every day and someone thinks to ask the bus driver why and the bus driver gives an excuse like she's helping me pick up trash or every look at the cameras because they're recorded for, every day. You know, every day, every single time. You know, it's days. Like, like all the time, you know. So that's to me where I think some something fell apart. There's something not properly planned for in these scenarios. And people need to either exhibit their some common sense and say, it just this just doesn't sound right to me. Because that wouldn't sound right to me. Well, and I <laughs> you think, know, I think you know some of what you're saying is is from the news report. Um, some is the filing right. from from the law firm that's suing the district. And so, right. for me, you know, you have all this information, <clears throat> and we have to figure out what in that is true, what mm. is not, what happened, what didn't, and then what protocols either were missed, if any, or were all protocols followed, and this was just a complete tragic event. 
and then what happened after. And so I think that is where with that investigation, we'll at least have peace of, of having those answers mm -hmm. and, and having the confidence with the community. Yeah. And, and if the protocols are enough visit. and there's nothing we protocols, can do exactly. what these, what these little girls went through, there's absolutely nothing that can be done to fix that. And that's the most devastating part. Um, but what can we do to just be even a little bit safer moving forward or a lot safer? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what can we do better? Yeah. How can we catch it on day two or four or one rather than 100, mm -hmm. you know? And, yeah. and by the way, when we do catch it, why don't we have a conversation with all the other kids, parents that are on that bus? I think that's where like my mind goes immediately to, you know, like, scandal like yeah. like something's going on here you know and then I put my tinfoil hat on and I start thinking conspiracy and and I'm not saying that that's was intentional or anything like that but I mean you know if you're saying that you told all the parents but all the parents are saying that you didn't and they're saying they never got any sort of notification the first they're hearing about it is when the news story breaks and that's three months later summer's gone come and gone and the kids are all back in school now um, and this happened, you know, this back in May when this when this actually was brought to the to the school district and to the school itself. So that's where I start to question. And I, you know, I hope the investigation, um, you know, uncovers whatever issues are are part of this process and and helps get some sort of resolution. Yeah, I want to see some light shed on that yeah. particular issue. You know, and. And if there were mistakes made, you know, we just want to hear apologies, you know, like, mm -hmm. hey, we messed up here and go forward. This is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all. I think that's all anybody wants to hear. I agree. I mean, heck, we listened to Bill Clinton apologize, yeah. you know, and everybody or not everybody, About but, the you know, like nationally, people forgave him. Right. Like people are willing to forgive people. Even if they hate them, you know, like they just do. That had a lot to do with the media. I mean, it it, abs it absolutely <laughs> does. Maybe that's a poor example, but I think that you get what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like that's what all people want to hear. They just want to be, they don't want to be lied to. Right. They don't want to be spoken to like they're not, you know, idiots. Well, transparency, which is why we love Garrett. Cause it's my favorite color. And it's, <laughs> Opaque. Impor it's, very it's important. It's <laughs> important. No, but I mean, that's, that's why I think transparency is so important. And that's really what people, well, I, like as a parent, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for transparency. I'm looking for the truth. We've been lied to enough over the last couple of years, both on a national level from our government, from, you know, the CDC or the NIH and Fauci and everybody else, it, you know, through COVID and elections, there's been a lot of lies that have been getting tossed around. And, you know, when something hits close to home like this, you just hope and would like to think that it doesn't happen, you know, that close to home. And then when this thing does happen, you know, when something like this does break in the news, you just expect a certain degree of professionalism and integrity and transparency from the school board and the school district about what's going on. And it just didn't sound like that's what was going on. But again, you know, let the investigation play out and see what actually occurred. And yeah, well, we'll, we'll see what they come up with missed. and then, uh, and then we'll be critical of them again. Right. You know, and we'll, we'll see if we can pick them apart and see if there's any holes in their stories. And if there are, you know, we'll bring those up. And if not, then great, you know, so be it. And then we can get back to what's important, which is, you know, bringing the ACT scores back up, right? Right. And bring in, uh, bring in kids' confidence levels back up. And I'm fixing the problems with, uh, uh, you know, with their current education trajectory because, you know, you mentioned ACT scores, you know, what I have a seven-year-old who, when we moved here, he was four. And then almost immediately, like, went into kindergarten and then, boom, COVID. Yep. And then he's learning from a Google Chromebook and had never really had that initial school experience in, in kindergarten and then into first grade. It be, it was, it's been different, right? Everything is Chrome. I mean, this kid's seven Wait. years old. He's got to lug a Chromebook to and from school all the time, and he doesn't like hardly writes anything, you know what I mean? So there's, there's a, 
something something just seems feels off to me i think covid <clears throat> it can be it, it's it's the biggest impact i think to where our kids are right now so some of the falling scores that you mentioned on the act some star scores you know that that, that went down a bit um I which think, is a state standardized test right i think that the overhaul of technology and the reduction of that personal relationship with the teacher where they're teaching, that is going to create ripple effects for many years to come. And, and what I would like to see all districts do is to pull back a little bit on that. Because for my, my daughter, we were in California when my she's now second grade, was in kindergarten. Right. And yeah, she's, she's five years old. They sit her in front of a Chromebook. And this is in California. The, the teacher um, pulls up you know, YouTube or whatever, whatever app they're using for the kids. And instead of the teacher reading a book to my daughter, she's watching a video of some on YouTube of someone reading a book. It just, it was so bizarre. Um, and then now we get here and we have a lot of Chromebooks and it's, it's been one thing that I would love to see us at least scale back on a bit at the elementary level, actually at all levels, but especially elementary. Um, but the technology I'm really concerned about, I want kids to be able to write and yeah. spell and be creative. They're staring at screens. And, and it's my, like ki- the my worst kids thing too, for them. my kids too, when they have free time, they want to be on their iPad or the Chromebook. I mean, that's, well, that's they need the creative brain at the yeah. first part of their life, right? Like your brain is very geared to be creative, right. uh, at, especially at the first five years. And then that, and then it starts to taper off and you start to be more analytical as you, you know, reach seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, eleven, twelve. You know, and some people stop at a certain spot, and some people continue to go, and that balance changes. But it's really important to focus on creativity when you're young. You know, yeah. And everybody can agree on that. All the experts agree on that. And what you get, it's a double-edged sword with this technology and not such a great personal relationship with these kindergarten teachers that these kids aren't getting because. One, you're not getting the indoctrination, but two, you're not getting the comfortability uh, that that a lot of people get when they're in kindergarten. When I look back, Miss Abbott was my kindergarten teacher, loved her. Um, Avery's kindergarten teacher was like one of her favorite teachers, you know, I mean, th- that's the teacher, that's your first introduction to the system, you mm-hmm. know, and they're set up that way to just kind of be you know, almost a clown, like, you know, fun experience that these kids are having. And they're just looking at their computer screens now. So they're going to have a different perspective on what school is now. Yeah. Not only that dude, but like my, I'm like my sixth and seventh graders, they like, they don't ever have homework. And I ask, I love that. I, I, I do, but I don't. And, and here's why, because I asked them, I said, well, what do you do all your, like, class? Like, you, what, what do you do in class? And then they explained to me, like, it's like, well, you know, there's a little bit of a lecture, and then we kind of sit down, and we just kind of go through our, and do all of our, you know, wor- coursework, or, you know, for the, for the class. And I'm like, so how much teaching does the teacher actually do in the class itself? And, you know, you had mentioned, like, oh, they, sh-, you know, in, in your daughter's, this class. was in California. Right. Yeah. I know. But right. here it's it's not all that different, it doesn't sound like, because there's a there's a bit of a lecture and they maybe go through some of the material, but then the kids are just doing their project work like in the class. And I'm like, Aren't the teachers teaching you while you're in the class? And he's like, Well, no. And I'm like, Well, what do they do? And he's like, Well, they just sit there on their phone or they do this or I they know. do that. And I'm just like, Well, wait a minute. Like, are they they're not teaching you the content. Like, how do you learn the content? And he's like, well, some, they teach us a little bit and then we sit down and we do our work. And I'm like, shouldn't that work be done at home? Like, shouldn't you be coming home and doing, isn't it like the more work you're doing at home is you're, you're doing your homework, which is a refresher of what you learned in the class. And if you're doing all that work in the class, what are you being taught by the teachers? And so I maybe, may, and this might not be every class, but yeah, a couple of things. Some the, of them, this I, is happening. Yeah, I mean, if if that's the case, I I would be surprised. But if that's the case, that the teacher's just on their phone, obviously that's something. not all the time. Yeah, but I mean, know. obviously that's something Sounds like you problem. should talk to your yeah talk to the principal. But I think the vast majority that would not be the case. We have great teachers. One thing I want to clarify is that um, 
at least for my kindergartner, I've had two now in, in kindergarten in Prosper. The technology is a lot lower in kindergarten from what it was in California, and I think as it gets into upper grades. But that's the concern as they reach third or fourth or fifth and then into middle school and high school. I think there's a lot of maybe even exclusive use of the Chromebook mm -hmm. when they're being taught. And mm -hmm. that's where I would I would love to see something different. Um, but our our elementary school teachers, they're amazing. I mean, we have we have awesome teachers. And if if they're using the heavy reliance on the Chromebook, it's because that's what the expectations have been yeah. set for them. So. Um, you know, I think we can definitely look at that and see if there's better ways to do it. But, um, I think yeah, I misspoke. I it wasn't that they were on their phones. He said email. Okay. They're checking email. I thought you meant they're just said. sitting there like scrolling. No, Facebook. I think what he said. No, no, <laughs> like, I think yeah, I, that's I, the impression I'm like, I got that's too. not what our teachers Yeah. Are let me correct. No let way. me make a correction. He, he, what he said was that they're, he's like, I, you know, checking email yeah, and gotcha. like online, you know, doing whatever it is that they're doing. It's probably school related stuff, but it's, you know, I still feel like. If my kid's in your class, you should be lecturing, teaching the content sure. and not just sitting there doing emails while they're doing homework right. effectively in class. Yeah. Jeremy and I were both on this podcast called Rad Dad and Dr. Jonathan Lopez actually is the host and he bought us a book called Of Boys and Men. And in that, he's they outline basically the differences between what boys and how they're uh, scoring on tests to measure how successful they are in the education system essentially have done over the past, you know, few decades since we've put a greater emphasis on children or uh, girls. Right. And basically what that, what that is and what we see from that is that boys and girls are completely different. Right. Mm -hmm. And we've all known that, but, Here's my problem with homework, right? Especially in the elementary school era, right? Is that these boys, they need so much more time to run around and be physical and focus on their creative brain uh, in order to basically set the groundwork in order to have that level of intellectual uh, ability later in life. And so these if we, if we crowd their brains with too much homework, in fact, I'm fine with no homework in elementary school, maybe here and there, but like yeah. for the most part, like they're going to school from 7.42 to 3 o'clock basically, you know? So, I mean, like that's whatever, seven hours of school and they're awake, you know, what, another six more hours or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, like come home, do your little commute, you know, like... 45 minutes of that's commute and then you're going to have dinner and you're going to have a, I don't know, you know, your commute and your dinner and whatever your extracurricular activity is. So you're really not even going to have that much time to just free play and be creative and think about whatever it is. Look, let's think about, which is yeah, all kinds I'm talking, of crazy stuff. I'm talking about middle school though. Like my, I'm talking about my two older ones who are in like yeah. sixth and seventh grade. Like elementary school is long gone. Like they're mature, like they, you know, more mature and they, you know, my daughter's in sixth grade going on, you know, fucking college, you know I mean? If you'd ask her, she's like, thinks she's in high school, like the way she acts, you know what I mean? But like, my point is, right. When you're, when you're getting, when, as you're getting older, right. You can retain more information. You can learn more. And I feel like there's a, uh, there, and, and again, I'm not like, you know, in the classroom. So I'm only going by what my, you know, 11 and 12 year old kids are telling me happens in the are classroom. Are able to articulate right? it. And, and like, <laughs> you know, you can, it's like you can only trust them as far as you can throw them. But I, I just think that there's maybe, in, at least from what I can tell, I mean, they're certainly not bringing work home unless it's a major project, right? And they have to do this major project over a course of weeks, or right. several days or whatever it is. Um, or they have to get together in their groups and get together out of school and get to get, you know, get all the materials for a, you know, for a project in class and whatnot. Um, it just, it just seems counterintuitive. To me, it's counterintuitive. I feel like there's, there's just not as much of the classroom lecturing and education component from the, from the teachers to the students in the class these days. And it's all very, here's your assignment 
you know, they spend 10, 15 minutes in a one hour class, like, Hey, here, you know, blah, 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 blah. Here you go. Here's your assignment. Like, I just remember in U S history, I'd be like, listen, then, uh, you know, my, my, uh, teacher talking about, you know, the revolutionary war and like lecturing on what happened in the revolutionary war, turn your propaganda to pages, about whatever. The revolutionary war. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. All the fake history, you know, right. we need that fake history. Right. But, but, and then like math, I just remember my math teachers up there on freaking, you know, the chalkboard and chalk and he's doing all these, you know, and he's asking you questions. He's like, what's X? And you're like, Good X hunting. is seven. And he's like, <laughs> yes, you know? Well, now but, they have 42 different types of math. Right. I well. think there's something, you know, our generation, we, we remember how it was when we were there. It was the chalkboard and the overhead projector and yeah. The yeah. Scantron and all of that. Scantron. Um, and so that's, you know, we, we view things from that mindset and we think that's the way to do things. And then now we see this as all completely technology. Newfangled. Um, and I think there's there's definitely a happy medium. Obviously, our district is extremely innovative. And if you go tour the schools, like I was saying, you're going to see all the opportunities that are there for the kids. Um, but yeah, the technology piece, I think there's something that, that like all of us remember, like, hey, why, you know, why so much or why aren't we doing this? So I think, I don't know, I think somewhere in the middle is good. We want to use technology as a tool, but not a crutch. Absolutely. I mean, we, it's fair. what we had, what soup, I had a super Nintendo or a Nintendo maybe when I was in high school and a clicker with a wire that was attached to my TV. So things have changed. You know, it's a brave new world out there. Yeah, obviously we're you using a, a little clicker more. with a wire and not <laughs> yeah, high school. Well, no, you know what I'm maybe, saying. Maybe elementary. Maybe middle. it's more like metal school or whatever it was, right? Like yeah. it's changed. The point is, is that, yeah, we've advanced yeah. and technology is more prevalent in this day and age. And therefore there's going to be a little bit more technology in our kids' lives. Yeah. yeah Which people, I'm fine with, I, yeah. Yeah, with, 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 you know, as, as a tool, I think that's great. Right. I do too. I, I do just, too. I'm just, like I said, I'm old school. I still read real books. And He's got an abacus. Not a Kindle. My wife tells our kindergartner when she goes to school, if she gets free time, she has to play with the little sensory bins. <laughs> she was like, if you do the Chromebook for your free time, you don't get to watch TV or whatever when you come home. Yeah. You, you don't get to so, do more Chromebook. I'm like, are you going to be emailing her teacher? You cannot email her teacher, babe. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> oh, uh, that's, that's great. Well, uh, thank you very much for coming back on. Yeah. Um, can't wait to have you back again in a month and talk about what's new. Um, and you know, as we evolve, um, and um, we'll probably start talking more about some, some, uh, you know, it'd be great to understand, like, or to get your perspective on things that are happening on a national scale too, from sure. a school board perspective. Um, right. When's this, um, when's this special investigation supposed to wrap up? Do they have an ETA on that? I'm not no? sure. Yeah. Don't know. Maybe next yeah. month I'll have some info. Okay. Maybe we'll do that. Maybe we'll do something else. Who knows? Yeah. Hey. You have to tune in to find November, out. That's November right. November 15th. November 15th. My birthday's the 14th. I get to spend my birthday with my six best friends. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> great. Be That'll be fun. Yeah, we'll my have birthday something is a nice. school board meeting, and then we'll be here on the 15th. Awesome. Perfect. Can't wait. Are you listening? Damn. All right, Patriots. Uh, that's it for this week. Please click those subscribe yeah. and share buttons, and we'd love for you to drop us a comment or a review. Thanks for hanging out with us once again, and a special thanks to our new monthly guest, Garrett Linker. We are Dudes Talking Freedom. I'm DTF. You guys DTF? I'm always DTF. All day. Every day, all night. For Jeff, Luke, Vince, and Garrett, this is Jeremy, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Ow! Let's go. Let's go.